Hey, how's it going, everybody? Charlie Wilson here, aka Sinister Charlie. Welcome back. Hi. Uh, I'm a little see through. That's weird. Okay. Uh, I guess we're doing that. <laughs> All right. Hey, uh, we got some more fat electrician. Uh, boop. Uh, gonna like that. Um, angry old veteran versus 700 redcoats. Samuel Whitmore. I uh, don't know anything about this. Uh, I would assume it has something to do with the British. <laughs> I don't know why I said it like that. Um, yeah, but uh, I, I guess Revolutionary War time. Let's go. Ah, uh, yes, the official state hero of Massachusetts. Massachusetts. Right. Today we're talking about Samuel Whitmore, quite yeah, possibly go. America's first anti-hero and the most gangster old man of all time. But first a word from our sponsor, old because man. this video is brought to you by Operation Ooh. Good Boy. Look at that puppy. Yes, your puppy. Oh, yeah, they make all kinds of dog-related products, from supplements to treats to toys to dog food picker upper bags. And Mushu a... absolutely loves the Made in America treats ready to I'm trying eat. Trying to figure out what kind of dog that Jake. is. Uh, do you roll over? Something doodle. Roll over. I don't know. Roll over. Come on. You got it. No, do the whole thing. You got to do the whole you gotta thing. You got to do roll the whole over. thing. Roll over. Roll over. You're making me look bad on camera. Yeah, roll you kinda over. Kind of rolled over. Fine. No, I don't want it. <laughs> so yeah, check them out at OperationGoodBoy.com. Use the code QUACK15 for 15% off. Let's get back to the video. All right, Samuel Whitmore. We don't know much, but here's what we do know. He was born in Charlestown, Massachusetts in 1696. From there, he goes dark. We don't hear from him until 1721 when he gets married to his wife, Elizabeth Spring. Then he goes dark again. There's nothing of him in the historical record until 1744. At the age of 48 years old, he would fight in King George's War. And during that war, he held the rank of captain, leading an entire platoon of dragoons during the siege the of Wallaceburg. If you don't know, dragoon is just a fancy word for cavalry. So think of like Malfoy's dad from yeah. the Patriot. It, same thing so that's cool whatever but here's the that is a really cool name for a cavalry though i guess rough riders would be in one for america i guess a good name the important part that nobody else ever brings up like i said he's a captain which is a way bigger deal than most people make it out to be and here's why there's really only two ways that you can become an officer in the british military at this Some point in time way number one you are born into a wealthy british aristocratic family and daddy's got a lot of money that's like 95 percent of the british officers at this point in time or way number two and way way less likely you are a complete badass doing gangster shit on the regular and they absolutely need you to lead some men given the fact that samuel's just some random colonial that was born in massachusetts it kind of narrows down which category he fell into he so he and his two. men help lay siege to fort lewisburg <laughs> that goes well they take over the fort from there the war is over so he heads back home to what is now arlington massachusetts from there he goes back to doing seemingly the only other thing he's good at because i'm not kidding you this guy does two things his entire life he plows stuff and he fights wars. When he's not fighting wars, he's, he's back at plowing. home plowing his fields oh. and plowing his wife because there this dude Thank has... You. 10 kids. I am not Jesus. kidding you. There was only two things on the historical record that even proved that this man existed for the next 10 years. One is the sheer amount of birth certificates where he is listed as the father. I mean, the mother is always his wife. He's not cheating on his wife. It's just they're having a bunch of kids. And mm -hmm. second, and my most favorite detail of this entire story, when he came back from war, he had a very, very decorative, ornate almost gaudy French officer sword covered in gold and rhinestones and jewels and all kinds of shit. And it became his prized possession that he would show off to all of his buddies in town. And when they would ask him where on earth he got that, the only thing he would say is, and I quote, the previous owner died suddenly. All right. Fucking, I acquired yeah. it. All right, so fast forward 10 years. <laughs> plow in the field and you got a lot of things to plow. It is now 1754, and Attila the Whitmore over here is approximately 58 years old, and the French and Indian War breaks out. Now, does Sam have to go fight this war? Absolutely not. He is a 58-year-old man in the 1700s when the life expectancy is 60. He should be killing over any minute now, but he also has 10 kids, so he's literally like, um, mm -hmm. honey, I gotta go beat up the French again. Okay, bye. <laughs> If you don't know, the French and Indian War is basically the Kingdom of France versus the British Empire, and both sides are backed by different Native American tribes. This is supposedly the war that Mel Gibson's character fought in in The Patriot, and presumably yeah. where he got his cool tomahawk from. Now, supposedly. I know what you're thinking. 
Did Sam Whitmore get a cool tomahawk too? No, no, no he didn't. But what he did no. get was two matching dueling pistols that were super cool. And you're never gonna believe this, but the previous owner died suddenly. Okay, yeah, look, it's I not stealing it. if they don't exist anymore. That's just the rules, I guess. So Sam and his men beat up on the French yet again. He acquires some fancy dueling pistols and then he heads back home. Okay, fast forward again. Blowing still, blowing in the field. It is now 1763 and Sam Whitmore is 67 years old and the Pontiac Rebellion breaks out. Surely he's gonna sit this one out, right? Absolutely not. He grabs his French sword, he grabs his double dueling pistols, his musket, and he heads off to war yet again. So he goes, he fights in that war for a little bit, comes back home, at which point he decides that he's gonna get involved in politics. So somewhere along the line, he starts rolling around in the political politics. circles, he finds himself at a fancy dinner party, and there's this guy there that's running for House of Representatives, and his name is John Vassal, and he represents everything that Sam hates. Sam is a small town farmer that's just trying to plant his crops and bang his wife, and this guy is like the big powerful merchant out of Boston, the big city, running the ports, making all this money. He wants to get into office to make laws more beneficial to him so he can be rich and yeah, Sam is just trying to he? get by. So <laughs> at this dinner party, Sam, who's not scared of anybody, informs him, hey, by the way, you're no better suited for office than the horse I rode in on. By the way, my <clears throat> horse's name is Nero. He's parked out front and he's not worth five pounds, which I'm not an expert <clears throat> in translating old timey colonial speak, but it sounds like he's saying you're not worth a horse's ass. Go fuck yourself. At which point, John Vassal gets very upset and decides that he is going to sue Sam for public defamation Ooh. for the price of 1,000 pounds, which is a shit ton of money back then. So the entire town finds out about this lawsuit and they all show up to court to actually watch the trial because Sam represents that grizzled old man that's just saying what's on everybody's mind, but nobody else has the balls to say. And he goes in and basically turns this entire trial into the roast of John Vassal, ends up winning, Sam Word. doesn't get sued, at which point he slaps him with a counter lawsuit on the spot and ends up counter suing him for $200 and wins. So that kind of launches Sam's Word political up. career. Fast forward again. I, I would have liked to know what the counter suit was for, whether it's just court costs or something. I don't know. It's still it is now 1765 and the British Empire <laughs> has been fighting France for quite a while and it's getting expensive. They need to make more money and the best thing they can come up with is the Stamp Act. Basically, they're going to charge the colonials a tax on every single printed Ooh. piece of paper that they come up with. This is like the modern day equivalent of if every time you made a phone call, sent a text, or visited a website, you had to pay a tax for it. And people are absolutely outraged, and Sam is infuriated. I mean, from his point of view, he's been fighting the French for the British Empire, and now he's gonna have to pay an extra tax just for doing it? He is so mad that he ends up becoming a hardcore revolutionary. But he's also like a 70 year old man, so he's mostly just serving on committees being like, hey, Maybe America should be its own country. We shouldn't pay so much in taxes, yada, yada, yada. Fast forward again. Still plow. It is now 1773. <laughs> Samuel Whitmore is a 70. Well, now he's going to, that's going to pop up again. Five-year-old man, <laughs> and gonna the British government has just rolled out their new and improved strategy for making even more money, the Tea Act. Yeah, they're going to start taxing the importation of tea, which will go down in history as one of the greatest ideas of all time. Now, at this point, Sam is serving on a committee representing his hometown of Cambridge, which would later become known as Arlington, and that committee sends a response to the British government in regards to the Tea Act that basically says, fine, if you're going to charge us more money, we're just not going to buy your tea because, and I quote, if we fail to assert our rights, we will dwindle into supineness. Now, like I said I earlier, not means. an expert in translating old-timey colonial <laughs> talk, but it supineness. sounds like Sam and his committee just told the British government that we're not going to buy your metric leaf water because we're not going to let you guys fuck us. That's why. At this point, pretty much everybody in America is pissed off. They start smuggling tea to avoid taxes. The Boston Tea Party happens December 1773. From there, people just start stockpiling guns and gunpowder and supplies getting ready for war if one should break out. Now, fast forward April 1775, General Thomas Gage is appointed the military governor of Massachusetts and he will be residing in Boston, which has been turned into a British military stronghold. At that point, General Gage decides, hey, you know what? I'm gonna get proactive. I'm gonna stomp out this whole rebellion talk right here and right now. I'm gonna take 700 men, an entire regiment, 
and I'm gonna march them out to Lexington and Concord. While they're in Lexington, they're gonna arrest those stupid, annoying revolutionaries, John Hancock happened. and Samuel Adams, and then they're gonna that continue marching to Concord, where they're gonna burn down all the stocked up military supplies. So the British military starts making preparations for a huge movement, at which point revolutionary spies find out and they decide to let everybody know. And when I say they decide to let everybody know, I mean a silversmith from Boston by the name of oh. Paul Revere is going to take off at midnight, ride through the entire countryside going how- By the way, there was another guy who also did it, and he rode further uh, to warn people about the British coming. But I guess Paul Revere got the like a lot of the credit. So. House to house, telling everybody that the British are coming. And guess whose house is between Boston and Lexington? Sam motherfucking Whitmore, that's who. I'm not Language. shitting you. It is like 99% <laughs> sure that Paul Revere showed up at 78-year-old Samuel Whitmore's house sometime in the middle of the night and was like, hey, just letting you know, the British are coming. At which point he's like, get off my lawn. Then presumably Paul Revere is like, okay, whatever, I gotta go warn everybody else, and Samuel goes back to bed. That morning, April 19th, 1775, the British are marching and they're almost to Lexington, and they are cut off <coughs> by 77 Minutemen, led by a man by the name of John Parker. John Parker orders the Minutemen to, quote, stand your ground, don't fire unless fired upon, but if they mean to have war, let it begin here. So the British roll up with 700 trained professional soldiers and tell these 77 Minutemen, literally farmers that just picked up whatever guns they had around, and told them, disperse you rebel scum. At which point the Minutemen are you like, rebel scum. nah, we're good. We're gonna stay right here and so are you. And that's exactly what happens. They just stand there staring at each other from across this field with the British officer not knowing what to do because he has to get to Concord to get rid of these supplies because those were his orders. But he also doesn't want to open fire on these guys because that will mean the start of the Revolutionary War. So they just stood there seemingly forever in formation, ready to throw down, waiting for the other guy to make the first move. And suddenly from the American side, a gun goes off. Nobody knows who fired, nobody knows why, but this was the shot heard around the world that would start right. the American Revolution. And for all we know, it could have been some old- Hey, I've seen oversimplified. I know, I know what happened, buddy. <laughs> farmer that just dropped his gun. From there, all hell breaks loose. Both sides fire on each other. Eight American Minutemen are killed, and the British advance towards Concord. The surviving Minutemen take off to go tell everybody that the Revolutionary War has officially begun, as the British spend the next four hours searching through Concord, gathering all the military supplies and lighting them on fire. Everybody in the surrounding area sees all the smoke jerks. from the burning supplies, and they think that the British military is burning down the entire town of Concord. Because of that, 2,000 Minutemen show up to fight back, at which point the British are like oh shit and they start retreating they run across the bridge and start ripping the planks off of it as they go at which point the 2,000 Minutemen and 700 British soldiers fire upon one another from either side of this bridge as the British continue to retreat. The British now have to march 18 miles back to their military stronghold in Boston in march. their stupid high-vis red coats, and every single American <laughs> with a gun between there and Boston is taking pop shots at them from the wood line. During this retreat, 26 red coats go missing, 175 are wounded, and 73 are killed, and three of them at least are from Samuel Whitmore. So we cut back to Samuel Whitmore. He's 78 years old, chilling at home, presumably plowing you know. something. What? We don't really know. And he just hears gunfire going off in the background, and it's getting closer and closer. And then he remembers, oh, that fucking kid woke me up last night in midnight <laughs> told me the British were coming. Maybe that's what's going on. So he goes, he grabs his fancy French officer sword, both of his dueling pistols, and his musket, and he goes out to the main road that the British would be marching past, and he's gonna stand by the stone wall next to the main road and just wait for the fight to come to him like the complete badass that he is. At this point, all the younger Minutemen are running up to check on this old man like, hey, what, what are you doing? You shouldn't be out here. And if you are gonna try to do this kind of stuff, at least go out in the wood line or in like a second story window to hide yourself like the rest of us so you don't get yourself killed. To which Samuel Whitmore responds, and I quote, if I can only be the instrument for killing one of my country's foes, I shall die in peace. Which I think we can all agree is line. gangster as fuck. Yeah. At this point, this yeah. man is literally the living yes. embodiment of old man strength. He's just that old grizzled veteran Viking that's got one more fight left in him and wants to die in battle so he can go to Valhalla. So he stays there, he loads his musket, he loads his pistols, and he waits. And he waits. And, he falls and asleep. finally, the British come marching right down the road 
dead at him. As they get close, he crouches down behind the stone wall with his musket and waits until they get to point blank range. And that's when he pops up over the wall, aims his gun. I said, get off my and this way. And fires, immediately okay. killing one Never red mind. coat on the spot, drawing both of his. I always just think something weird and ridiculous is going to happen. His pistols, killing two more red coats drawing his sword and charging okay. into over 500 <laughs> okay. soldiers on his own. He is then immediately shot yeah, in the face. He falls to the ground and is somehow still alive, so he reaches to grab one of his guns and start reloading it, at which point the British run up and stab him with bayonets somewhere between 6 and 13 times. Sure. Apparently, after the first five, they all kind of blend together. He is then clubbed in the head with the butt of a rifle and left <laughs> for dead God. as his body lays there mangled and lifeless as the British continue to march through the town on their way to Boston. Four hours later, the townspeople notice that his corpse starts moving. So they pick Samuel oh, up, they no. get him over to the doctor, they alert the family, the family shows up to the doctor, at which point the local town doctor, Nathaniel Tufts, is like, no. The dude is 78 <laughs> years old. He wasn't prepared to handle a fall down the stairs, let alone getting stabbed 13 times and shot in the head. Okay, like there's no way this old man's gonna make it. But like I said, his family members start showing up and guess how many direct descendants Samuel Whitmore has at this point in time after all that plowing? Go ahead, give it a guess. Say it in your head. 70th. Okay, you got your number? Six. Okay, he's got 185 okay, living mind. descendants. Okay, he's got... Five I just said generations. I just said 76 because it's, you know, 17, 70. Beneath him, he's got kids, grandkids, great grandkids, great grandkids squared, and great grandkids cubed. 185 people showing up to the doctor, like, hey, save grandpa. At this point, poor Dr. Tufts is like, I'll try. <laughs> Dude's gonna die, but I'm not about to tell 180 grandkids that, so I'll try my best. So he does what he can, he bandages him up and sends him home with his family and they take care of him for the remainder of his days. And when I say the remainder of his days, what I mean is, let me check my Good notes night. real quick. Uh, I mean that he passed on February 3rd, 1793. This motherfucker lived for 18 more what? years and passed away at the age of 96. Wow. And to commemorate Samuel Whitmore, there's actually a monument where That's he made insane. his last stand. You said that he was 78 during his last stand and 96 when he died, and that clearly says that he was 98 when he died and 80 during his last stand. Why are you so dumb? Bah. Okay, look, I understand your point, and I also can kind of sort of read, and I realize the irony because this is literally written in stone, and I'm telling you that it's wrong, but it is wrong. That is the only source that says that he was 98 oh. when he died and 80 during his last stand. Every other source says that he was... Someone got a little sloppy with the uh, headstone there. 78 and 96. <laughs> this has been proven to be false multiple times, but they don't want to change it because the monument's already so old. So yes, I'm sticking with what I said. But the most important part of this picture is to actually zoom in on the house in the background. Dad's That's house. Samuel Whitmore's original house where he lived his entire life. And it's still around today as a historical site in Arlington, Massachusetts. And that <laughs> monument is in the front yard. So if you're not picking up what I'm putting down, what I'm trying to tell you is, in conclusion, this has been the story of America's first and oldest gangster, a 78-year-old grizzled veteran that woke up on the first day of the American Revolutionary War and decided to casually go 3-0 while telling the entire British Empire to get off his lawn. Thank you for watching. Best way to support the channel is go buy some merch over at the fat electrician. I did actually buy a shirt, so uh, whenever that gets here, uh, should be a week or so. Com, quack bang, <laughs> out. Beat it. The do, 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 do. You found it, but <laughs> I've never been more excited for a future T-shirt design. I can see it now. America's original gangster. Get off my <clears> lawn. <throat> Samuel Whitmore with two cross dueling pistols and a sword. It's gonna be fantastic. We found out about an old guy who was shooting the British, and he was pretty cool from what they said. I so stop. <laughs> stop. So I stopped making a fool of myself. I can't help it. Um, yeah, there you go. Uh, Sam Whitmore. Oh, uh, uh, God. Uh, I'm very tired. Uh, yeah, there you go. Sam Whitmore. That's cool. I never heard that before. Um, yeah, uh, thanks for watching. I really appreciate it. Please likey and subscribe down below. Makes me feel good inside, helps out the channel. Uh, and if you got any suggestions, put them down below. Um, 
everything that is fat electrician has been suggested to me. So if you guys have any other like military type stuff or anything in general, really, um, yeah, go ahead and put that in the comments and I will get to it if I can. Uh, I generally don't do videos more than half an hour long because then it just turns into me sitting and watching and not saying anything, which is weird. It's just like me. It'd be like me sitting in the living room watching something for half an hour and you just staring at me. Uh, so, yeah, there you go. Um, thanks a lot for watching. I really appreciate it. And bye.